Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Rekha, and I'm part of the IIHS Word Lab and Library Teams, which host, uh, which host public text every month. Uh, before we begin this evening's session, there's some small uh, housekeeping rules. Some of you may be already familiar with it, with the number of webinars that are going on. Uh, please post your questions for the panelists using the Q&A option on your Zoom screens. Uh, this session will be recorded and made available on the IHS uh, YouTube channel sometime tomorrow. Uh, the link to that is in the chat box. There's also a link to a sign-up sheet. Um, please leave your contact details there if you would like to stay updated on upcoming events. Uh, today's panelists are Nisha Susan and Kripa G. Nisha is the co-founder of two award-winning media companies, The Lady's Finger and Grist Media. She currently writes Cheap Thrills, a column on millennials, time, and obsessions for the Mint Lounge. Her nonfiction work focuses on culture, gender, and politics. Nisha's work often explores the intimacy and strangeness that the internet phenomenon has brought to India. The Women Who Forgot to Invent Facebook and Other Stories is her debut short story collection. Kripa, who will be moderating today's session, is the author of Rivers Remember and a recipient of the Ladley Award in 2017. Her reportage and cultural writings have appeared in the Hindu, First Post, and several media platforms. Her short fiction has appeared in Sahitya Academy's Indian Literature, Muse India, Voices from the Attic, Scroll.in, and Blink Inc. Kripa's column, Misrepresentation, appears every Wednesday in the New Indian Express. Thank you, Nisha and Kripa, for being part of Public Text today. Over to you now. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so, so happy to be here talking to Nisha about her uh, superb collection of stories, The Women Who Forgot to Invent Facebook. Um, I jumped right in. I'm not going to do a lot of these uh, uh, you know, intros and all at the beginning because all of my uh, observations are actually part of the questions that I'm going to that I'm going to be speaking to Nisha about today. Um, I think we'll start with the reading so that people get a sense of what we're going to be talking about. And please go and buy the book. Uh, you know, if you haven't already done it and if you're listening to this, just go and buy it right away. It is worth your time and your money. Please do it because uh, as you will discover from my questions, I haven't enjoyed a book this much in a really long time. So thank you, Nisha. Shall we start with the reading? Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, for everyone who's watching, um, Tripa has uh, evilly asked me to read one of my most evil stories for reasons that will become very obvious. The story is uh, called Workout of the Day and uh, it's uh, set in Delhi. In, uh, the protagonist is a, um, a sort of middle-aged uh, male uh, journalist, um, you know, good at his job, but spends 90% of his time politicking rather than being political editor okay so this is somewhere in the middle of the story they, they, there was a sort of newsroom meeting where everybody was you know sort of locking horns and uh, Sanjeev who's most interested in locking horns more than anything else uh, exits the meeting feeling that he had been a little bit squashed by various ladies in the meeting and this is what happens immediately after um, Amit appeared at his side suddenly and hustled him off to his office. They gossiped about election coverage and discussed a new reporter they wanted to hire in Assam. Then Amit said, oh, ho, bhai, I had completely forgotten that Bhavna has that total activist background. Until she said that thing about women needing to work. Bap, re, bap, I'm really scared to open my mouth these days. Sanjeev said, it's all become quicksand. Things were so much simpler before. Amit said, what shit? When were they simpler? Not things, things. Just speaking was simpler, language was simpler. See, in Malayalam and in Hindi, the phrase for a female servant is woman with a job. Kamwali, velakarti. That's what it is. That's the correct usage. A woman with a job is a servant. Amit Gafford, listen, my dear Panini, you can please keep these etymological insights to yourself. Though on most Mondays, boss, if anybody was willing to pay for my lifestyle, I'd happily stay at home. What's wrong with women? Why don't they exercise the choices they have? Look at your wife. She at least is smart. Look at mine. She's insane. God knows what she's doing. I don't even want to know what her new business is all about. Should I be worried that she's in Bangkok every month? Amit was about to slip into his usual humble brag about his super rich, serial entrepreneur, Taipei wife, Sanjeev knew. So he made his exit. 
After a quick twi Twitter break and an even quicker Instagram break, he went over the draft, did a few nips and tucks and filed the op-ed. Literally nothing was happening in the world on TV. Sorry, I, I just want to say this is the opposite of what is happening in the world. Okay. <laughs> anyway, literally nothing was happening in the world on TV. He was in the middle of his meeting with the Delhi reporters when the Patna correspondent called saying he had filed a story, but it had somehow disappeared in the system. And now he couldn't leave his house because the city had flooded. Sanjeev immediately put him on speakerphone and demanded to know the details of this natural disaster that had only affected his house because there was no news that Patna was flooded or had he forgotten to file that? Oh, it was only his street, was it? Sanjeev reamed him out, gave him a new assignment and promised him that if he called on Monday saying he couldn't file then, he, Sanjeev, would come to Patna to see him swim in the Ganga. His Delhi boys were laughing as they listened to Sanjeev's end of the conversation. They knew better than to try these stunts with him. So, I mean, this is now Sanjeev. But to skip to the bit that Kripa is really interested in, which is uh, towards the end of the story, um, like in the last few pages, uh, Sanjeev has now done something fairly terrible. And he's waiting to sort of lord it over the person he has done it to, uh, a woman called Bhavna. When Sanjeev saw her coming down the long corridor, he almost leaped out of his cabin. Shouldn't rush a punchline with his eagerness, he told himself. He slowed to a saunter. Fat Amulya was rolling slowly up behind her. But for once, he was not scared of her dead, louche eyes. He was almost jumping up and down inside his beautiful coat. A coat he'd never have been able to wear if he had stayed in Bombay. Sticky, dead city. Dead, dead, dead. There was Bhavna. And there was her expressionless face. When she was close, when she had almost passed him, he said, I thought you were a brave little feminist. She continued to look at him with her face as thoroughly wiped of expression as if she had hired a Kamwali to do it every morning. I've never seen a feminist as panicked as you were the other night. Have you ever driven so fast before? Jumped a light too? Sanjeev saw Bhavna's face slowly moving from expression to expression like those morphing faces in that old Michael Jackson video. Confusion, shock, more shock. His own face was stretched in the biggest smile. He was about to laugh out loud, but saw her face twist into rage. Sanjeev paused. Why are you angry? He asked. Her mouth hissed silently. He saw rows of small, perfect teeth pointing at him, and then she was gone. She was furious. For what? For some months, his desktop had had a picture of Shobhna, not a still from her movies, but one of her in a regular sari in the, in the Nataraj pose. The sari messily falling from her rampaging right thigh as high as her head, her pallu flying in the air, not like those neat Bharatanatyam costumes. He wasn't too sure where this photo was shot. It wasn't on stage. It looked like a living room. It was like a housewife had gone nuts. If anyone asked, he talked about how he was such a fan of Shobhana's, but that wasn't it really. He just couldn't take his eyes off that photo. The feeling that for once it was an image that was real, that got it, cut through all the crap. He wished he could take Bhavna by her hand, gently to his laptop, and show her the photo. Maybe then he would understand, she would understand what he had tried to do for her on Saturday night, and why she needed to get a grip on her feelings. That Yay! <laughs> I'm going to try and do a screen share now so people can see the uh, that photo. Let's see if uh, we can sort of see it. So yesterday, Krupa gave me and general public on Twitter a heart attack by suddenly <laughs> sharing images as part of her research on this book. I mean, I've never been so pleased before, like <laughs> so happy. Can you see it now? Can I can. See? You can see? Okay. So I'm assuming everybody saw it. So I'm going to stop the sharing now. And uh, I mean, I was reading this story. I mean, for most of these stories, I had this reaction, right? Like, oh my God, I know what you're talking about. I can't believe there is something that I can relate to this well. Because I've been in a newsroom and I've literally had male colleagues who had this as their desktop wallpaper. And I, and I was thinking, wait, was there another reason that all these men had this image as their wallpaper that I was so innocently not really, you know, thinking through? So I want to ask you, you know, about this, about writing this down, first of all, uh, you know, writing about this image down and, and then, uh, you know, wh what sort of made you put it in a story? I mean, uh, and the larger context of this question really is, 
you know there are no itals in your book there are no footnotes there's no apology for you know the kind of pop culture references that you're making it's as if you want people to just know if they know otherwise you can go and google it or you know f off <laughs> so uh, i want to ask you like what were the what was the sort of thinking that was going in your mind did you even have like a back and forth about should we explain this should we explain that or should we just let people get this and so i'll let you go on now um i i generally uh, i generally try to work the explanation into the story so if you if you the sentence is not one of her movie stills but whatever so then you know if you haven't heard or if you forgotten or whatever you i mean so i feel like that's a relaxed way of doing it um but also i just feel like we all learn so many things you know like people are prepared to read icelandic literature like so then you can learn about shobna also it's okay i mean i i understand because i you know i worked in a newsroom in delhi and um, one time um, i we ran a story about this um party that every year suhasini maniratnam organizes and uh, it's all the stars of her era yeah. and it's got, i mean they have matching t-shirts yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the matching matching t-shirt it's just like delightful okay and she talked about organizing the party and everything so we had this story and i, I was running features at that time for telka and uh, we ran the story it was fine the next week there was something else some other tamil cinema thing that had happened it was like a big event it was like some once in two years event it was maybe a rajnikanth movie or something okay it was that kind of unavoidable event so mm. we were going to run a piece and uh, my colleague who's very nice girl uh, asked me don't you think this is too much south india and you know like i i almost went into the shobhna pose myself right in the middle of the room. so so i mean i do understand but i feel like the the way to just deal with it is just continue regardless making your own jokes and just hoping that other people will catch up you know just right. like don't bother is my right. approach right so and the other question about this story this particular story was your um, thing to write about write this man this totally misogynist what was going through your mind when you were writing this story when did you write it i mean was there something happening yeah 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 okay so this is actually like a fun thing so i wrote it i wrote it i think the year before me too okay right so i wrote it because uh, the central act of violence in the story is something that someone had uh, described to me and i couldn't get over it and i kept thinking about it and i kept wondering why did he do it what is wrong with him i mean i mean i know the person involved so i kept it still in my head and then the newsroom scene is something that i'm comfortable with as in so in the original act of violence also was committed on a colleague so i put it together i i uh, sent it to one of my favorite editors in, and he's a um, uh, indian american uh, and uh, in a literary magazine abroad so i sent it to him and you know it's for the first time he he felt it just didn't work okay and i was kind of squashed because i think like okay now in retrospect i think what he was saying is that this person is so consistently horrible how can anybody be so consistently horrible right so i also felt like chai i'm such a waste and you know i haven't done a good job of the story and you know i just gave it up and then me too happened and then i kept thinking my god my i am a waste because this person is just not evil enough i mean the yeah. kind of stories you hear from everywhere right every right. organization seem to be some cesspool of uh, <laughs> craziness so Ha right. so that's the right. that, that after yes, he almost scene, comes across like a saint in hindsight <laughs> yeah because he has such mixed feelings about women and power i mean on one hand he's like shobhna and then the other hand he's like bhavna is too thin and the other one is too fat and his wife is too simply and like i mean he's got you know problems <laughs> problems yeah yeah but then uh, so this was going to be a question for later but since since you mentioned it now i'm going to bring it up now there is a lot of serious things happening in this collection i mean people have described it as like a fun read is like a light read but you know there are like spouses being bumped off some stinky rotis appearing and then a good swimmer is drowning like a man is like you know doing something to his colleague Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are doing some pretty seriously messed up, you know, sl- like cruel sl- sort of stuff. Uh, and you know, is that something? Is that a theme that you noticed uh, through these stories that you picked for this? Is like some like a streak of 
cynicism. No, I mean, I like, I like, I mean, as a, as a reader, I like reading crime fiction. I mean, it's my, it's my go-to thing. I really enjoy it. Um, and I don't, I mean, it's a big ambition that I have to write a crime novel at some point, but I, I don't feel like I have the chops for it yet. So in some, in some way, approaching acts of crime, acts of violence in, 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 another, in another way allowed me to get some of my, um, I don't know, like excitement played out in that way, but also to approach uh, it in a different way also satisfied some points of curiosity. Like, I, like because I know the person who inspired Sanjeev and that particular thing, um, I, I have ongoing curiosity about people like that. Um, or Liji's character, people who were always chill and, you know, just calm and just lying <laughs> a lot, but inspiring this fanatic devotion in other people, like romantic uh, devotion in other people is just mind boggling. The rest of us are like, do you mind if I just take one chip from your plate? You might break up with me. And then, you know, there's Luigi who's like, you know, please yeah, like just murder someone for me. It's cool, <laughs> you know. So that, that, that curiosity also was something I was trying to work with in these stories. Good. Good. So now, we'll, now I'm going back to the first question that I originally planned, which is the titular story. Okay, So if I were to describe the story to people, it would be hectic, which is like, I read it breathless, like the Shankar Mahadevan song. Um, you know, it's just like, tang, tang, tang. a lot of things are just happening in, in that. And then yet you feel like, oh, nothing much is really happening, but there's a lot happening. Like, do you remember? I mean, I know it's been a while since the story first appeared online. And do you remember what we went into making like a story like that, you know, like, you know, the, the pace of this story, or do you remember it just coming out like that? Or do you, did you have to work? I, yeah, on it? I, I mean, it was, it was one of those stories that just like, it was easy to do. Say for instance, um, no filter was one I had to work quite a bit on, or, um, mm -hmm. even the last story is one I had to work quite a bit on. This is something I wrote in a couple of hours and it was fine. Uh, it, uh, was because I, I wanted mm -hmm. to work with the form of the first person plural, you know, where, um, the story is right. about a group, right? And I had just read a novel right. on that year or the previous year, a novel which was first person plural. Um, and then we came to an end, which is about a company closing uh, and uh, everybody right. being laid off. So that was kind of amazingly fun and sad novel to read. And I just, as an experiment, wanted to try it. And this uh, thing of doing a scene, you know, like, the, this uh, scene from the early 2000s where uh, in a bar where everybody sort of knows each other and but more than actually knowing each other it's that thrill of having a scene you know that the thrill of saying you know I know the guy who owns the bar and you know he'll if, if it's too late, he only take me home and then you know you know everybody's backstory and then you're sort of conquering a world of your own you're start out of college and you feel like, okay, I found a home away from home in some like really seedy bar, right? And right. that's something, that's like an act of pride. So that's something I, I wanted to write about. Right. Um, so, so since you mentioned the 2000s and the coming out of college, bit, so I wanted to, you know, sort of ask you about, um, you know, when the book, I'm assuming when some part of the stories were being written, like being a millennial wasn't really, you know, we, it thing. wasn't really a part of our you know, consciousness and we were so new to the internet and we can see that in your writing also, right? The kind of encounters that like women are having with the internet and we're doing some really silly things, which we continue to do now. Did you ever have like a sense of, um, you know, when you revisited some of these stories, did you feel like, um, uh, you know, con making them more contemporary? Did you have that urge to sort of, you know, it all, some stories almost read like a time capsule. I know it, it must, it, it's deliberate, I know, because it begins at, you know, the beginning of internet and then it sort of slowly works its way yeah. towards more scary things that the internet gives us now. But did, were you ever tempted to sort of, you know, um, or some of the stories like the early ones, like the the beginning stories, for instance, are sort of like... I mean, for instance, women, women who forgot to invent Facebook has actually no internet. Right. Like, it has no internet. They're just doing lots of time waste on their own. And they, they, right. they have 
like they use the internet for uh, us uh, college applications like this I, is, or email you know that that kind of like sedate sedate activities and uh, the activities are really like offline it's like right. a lot of drink a lot of drinking right. a lot of sex and a lot of gossiping right like hectic gossip yeah so um, yeah. but later like when you think about trinity and stories like that i feel like it works in that time it it works in in that particular zone right if you if you updated trinity for now mm-hmm. you know that when they these girls are on the college festival circuit and everything oh my god it would be completely different right they would be right. they would be up, they would be uploading stuff on instagram and they would be on tiktok and uh, you know they, 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 like um, i i said to a woman a friend uh, oh you know tiktok has been banned and mm-hmm. she said she said good okay <laughs> and i was like oh okay because oh. she has a daughter she has a daughter who's a dancer <laughs> she has a daughter who is a dancer there in mangalore in kundapura and uh, she said i mean i can't replicate her really cool kannada but in her uh, thing she said that basically any time i look my daughter's on the beach in some like pose like this and some guys balancing her in some other way and some third guys taking her photo i'm so glad like tiktok has been banned okay so all of that could have been worked into uh, a trinity which is set currently which is actually kind of right. a fun prospect but um, <laughs> okay now that i think about it but these women would be very different then no i mean yeah. they, they yeah. would be um those two girls would be preoccupied by very many other things i think right for right. instance right. i think there would be shoots inside blas mohan's tailoring shop for instance they, they would be they would be they would be with the cameras on right so <laughs> yeah but i loved it i mean just the way it was i was just i was just thinking of so many people i should send the book to and i've been like every day i come up with a new person i think oh my god this person would so totally love this book because it really feels like um like reading about like your own sort of especially for people who are like my age right so then now i want to speak to you about um form as in uh, it feels it almost feels like we are sort of dropped in the middle of you know these stories and then we're watching like an episode just sort of play out in front of us and there's also sort of like a you know you've sort of rejected this whole uh, beginning middle end sort of a thing right it's sort of it's a it's almost like a wave uh, i don't know how to describe it uh, almost these i don't know i felt like i was watching an asian cinema uh, sort of thing you know like in many of these episodes so what inspires this sort of yeah. <laughs> um so what is, what is, what is this form like you know when you sit down to write down write a story for instance what uh you know what is what is form look like to you what are you trying to achieve like what are you you know sort of trying to do so i think um i actually have thought more about it now in the last few weeks since people have been asking pointy questions than in all <laughs> these years but uh, um i think it's very verbal in in the sense right. that i think a lot of the stories my first instinct is to tell it the way i would tell it if i was telling you in person right and then mm. sometimes it doesn't work that way so then i have to tweak it and move it back back and forth so um for no filter i mean if mm. if i met you in person and we had half an hour to spare i would mm. uh, tell you the story that inspired uh, no filter which is crazy okay it is like right. it has my story has not a patch on it okay so but <laughs> the, the, and it is only possible to tell you and you know just like continuously implore you to believe me that it really happened okay uh, but uh, so that's 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 really my instinct but sometimes that doesn't work so you know you have to just move around things and see what works in prose so but fundamentally right. it's a it's a sort of verbal instinct um i, right. I that's i think the best description that i have for it right right that's very interesting so um then since we are also talking about form i uh, one of my favorite things um uh, was in mist call you write about uh, uh you know ex- you write exploding and flying about the house like mustard seeds right there are some very uh, you know many um culturally relevant idioms in the stories that are sort of that don't feel like that feel like very casual but they're very 
sort of evocative and this they without having a sense of being clunky if you know what i mean like when you're trying to do a, like an indian english uh, metaphor or sort of trying to describe or they they don't feel clunky they feel almost sort of like natural what sort of is going through your mind when you're when, you, when you're looking at you know i mean i'm assuming you don't say uh, you know when you're telling me the story you probably wouldn't use the expression exploding and flying about the house like mustard seeds i mean i would laugh you know fall rolling on the floor and i'd be laughing but what sort of goes through your mind when you're writing something like this you know um yeah um okay so i think uh, i think it's a point of view thing right so for instance in that particular story it is a, a woman in her 30s she's a mom she's a cook um she's highly intelligent and observant and uh, she's had this uh she's like looking at what is happening to her family and thinking thinking about it and she, she's affectionate about her children she loves them but she's also very sharp eyed she's not uh, she's not taken in by uh, some scams that her children are pulling on her right so right. I, i i think i think for that story i i did try to think through how, i mean i tried to think through what would be uh, accessible images what would be expressions that that might work what uh, and i think it's it's an easy um, it's like a swamp uh, that that whole thing because if because uh, this such a multilingual country and so complicated there's so much caste class everything and somehow we have to express it all in this flat english okay right. it's just like chapati okay and then <laughs> so it's this like this nothing is going on so somehow to to make it more of more like us then you end up saying artificial things like her skin was like turmeric or something some ridiculous i mean so it's a swamp i feel okay right. or you go in other direction of uh, equating americanisms with modernity right. so uh, a friend of mine was recently reading a, i think a full years worth of uh, contemporary indian writing and you know and frequently messaging me saying this one's great that one's wonderful and just having a good time really mm-hmm. and but every once in a while she, she and she's a very sharp reader so every now and then she would complain of this point of view problem where someone set in the historic past is suddenly speaking in some americanism right. and and this is an otherwise very accomplished uh, book so i mean whenever she told me my heart would quail okay because i'd be like i'm sure i have also done it somewhere in this book there is some piece of shit waiting to hit me in the face you know <laughs> but uh, it is that problem i think of um trying to represent this really rich uh, world in this flat space you know uh, but and i then, think you did a great job of it nisha i mean like if i may just interrupt to tell you that but it it feels like you, the the multiplicity of the tongues you can really sort of glean it from the book you can see that you can see that this character speaks many languages and it sort of is there and you sort of use uh, which is language. which is the truth for most of us right even like right. i mean it's it's really hard to find a monolingual person in in india, in india. yeah and uh, south of the windows it's it's like i think if if you can actually find someone you you know it'll be some <laughs> award winning category because it, it doesn't seem to exist yeah. i i think gro- growing up in bangalore i used to feel embarrassed that i only spoke three languages properly <laughs> in class 4 okay because my in class 4 my classmates would be all speaking six languages back and forth and i'd be like filled with shame because <laughs> i spoke two properly and the third one was kachada so you know so um, i mean it it is like a big uh, it is a big ambition of mine to try to make it work in english properly and in, in the english that we all speak but i i do think it's a swamp i mean yeah. you can just drown and die any minute <laughs> yeah yeah and if anybody is looking for pointers on how to do it right i suggest they read your book because you're doing yeah. you, you're on to something <laughs> so um this is something that i noticed in some of your interviews also you've been asked i have been stalking all your interviews in preparation for this talk um hey, so what first time, first time. <laughs> so i want to ask you about uh, you know sort of writing a, a characters whose politics don't necessarily you know match with yours with mean, there are quite a few of them in the book 
um and do you ever sense a sort of conflict when you write them or how are you able to get through that you know will people really will people get what i'm trying to say here are they going to think it's me who has this view so how are you sort of able to separate that's very admirable i feel because a lot of people get especially now get stuck in this idea of uh, you know not being able to differentiate between what the, their politics is and their character's politics is right so um okay i i, I want to tell you a joke first <laughs> so my uh, the story teresa was first published in uh, caravan right and uh, it uh, so if you go online and you look at the place where it is online there are a few comments underneath so i don't think i'd registered the comments right off because i uh, i think one point maybe a year or two after it was published i went and looked and there was someone who who said don't try to pretend this is some other person's language this is obviously your own english so basically Teresa, which has very conventional English, that it, I mean, it doesn't experiment at all. This person, whoever it was, was expressing some rage and saying that, I know this broken down English is yours. Don't try to attribute it to a character. So I was fascinated by this whole thing. Okay. And I was like, wow, this is like a real wormhole that you can just like go down. But uh, the political end also is interesting, right? I mean, people do seem to get more and more confused lately. So if you have a character express a particular point of view, people get very worked up and whatever. I just, I mean, at that point, I wasn't thinking too much. Mostly, again, it was just experiments to see what do you actually relate to in terms of feeling. Like, for instance, in, in Trinity, mm. all the girls are like, super bitchy okay they're super bitchy and they're super bitchy to each other and they're super confident and you know just like everything um but you may not relate to the ending where uh, the narrator feels betrayed by her girlfriends getting married in arranged marriages and you know sort of leaving um leaving adventure behind you may not relate to that that might be not be your politics but you do relate to, I, I hope, like we all of us relate to that moment where you feel left behind by your friends in some way or the other. Right. You know, it, it right. might be that you're the one who chose a conventional life and the other others picked a life of greater adventure and then you feel betrayed and left behind. So the betrayal is a, let's say, unfortunate universal. So that feeling is what guides the story more than, than anything else, I think. Right, right, right. So um, Sanjeev's confusions, for instance, I mean, I can't say I have made too much sense of it, but I tried to work with his confusion towards women. Like what, right. what he, he seems to be actually quite affectionate to men is my feeling. Like he's, I mean, if you were a guy, you'd think that Sanjeev is a pretty great guy, yeah. right? Like you yeah. never see his strangeness towards women at all. Right, so. right. right. Yeah. So I love um, what uh, K.R. Meera calls your stories, which is um, unusual anti-romantic stories, right? Uh, what does anti-romantic mean to you? I mean, like somebody asked me uh, about the book because they knew I was going to do this event and I told them uh, that I think K.R. Meera used the perfect word. Uh, I think she's already said all that there is to say in her blurb for the book. I don't know what everybody else is going to do. but. I think it's just sort of, there's something that sort of really, um, what she says sort of really captures it. What is, what are these stories and are they anti-romantic to you? What are they? Hmm. Hmm. It's interesting. So, uh, my friend, uh, Paramita used the word uh, heroic to describe some things. And I found that interesting. Again, it's something that I've been thinking about recently and it's true that the viewpoint is often heroic in that um, uh, the narrator in No Filter has a very idealized image of his uh, <laughs> past, his uh, college life, of Liji, of uh, everything of himself. Okay, it's very like dramatic. And, or the people in Trinity, um, it, Teresa has this very, very like larger than life thing going for everyone who meets her. So I, I think, um, there is a heroic tendency and and i think that's uh, perhaps part of me as well when i when i meet people and uh, and 
you know 20 years later also when i've known mm. them for a very long time i continue to have very very larger than life images of, of them they they are it's like so there is a landscape and other people in my life are very large monuments you know so so th- there is that tendency but um anti romantic yes i guess in the sense that th- the pettiness of people and the not niceness of people and uh, the embarrassing details and everything is there mm-hmm. but you know we we tend to love people knowing those things somehow also right so i'd like to in- include those and i think in some in some like let's put some pickle in this thali sort of ways when i wrote uh, a, like a pure sexual fantasy which is triangle which right. is from the beginning to the end it is it is a big it is like a big eclair or something right there is there's no there is no pretending to be anything else in that sense so, <laughs> yeah so <laughs> right um so this is i think we're at 6:40 so this will possibly be my last question because we have quite a few questions that i have to go through from people um so women experiencing and encountering internet right i mean why was this the theme for this book for instance i mean i'm guessing you picked this to fit the theme these stories to fit this sort of theme from other stories and that you worked on over the years so uh and i know that you have you you you've sort of founded and run like like a you know like so a website that has been a part of all our lives and it's sort of been uh, it lady spring has been a space where a lot of us sort of turn to when we when you're sort of like looking for oh this person has written today something you know let me go and read what they've said and so yeah. what about the internet and women um sort of has been with you all of this while that made you want to put together this book and you know what Right. what was it so i think for me when i was putting together the book it was really the internet uh, mm. not women okay mm. uh, in in the last few months of 2019 as my editors and yours we, we shared <laughs> editors uh, started looking at my finished ish manuscript and so one of the things that they said oh the, the women characters are very interesting and you know we had this back and forth about it and i published uh, one story uh, in an indian express uh, which amrita datta from indian express had uh, commissioned uh, the one called uh, mindful and mm-hmm. when mindful was published in december of 2019 i noticed a lot of responses online i i'm i'm not saying it was like some viral sensation or something anything but from within those responses uh, i noticed it was always women and they all had very very interesting responses um, and so then it's all coming together for me but honestly i just i mean i i i can pretend that i had thought about it but i hadn't i had just written about the internet and i written stories from women's perspective because yeah <laughs> okay that's just it right? it just happened to be that way right okay so now i'm going to go into i'm looking at my phone very rudely but that's where all the questions are so um there are quite a few questions i'm going to start with the easiest one sanjay from instagram must what's your favorite read what's my favorite read what are you reading or what's what have you read that you really like maybe recently i'll add a word to sanjay's question so i mean because this is like asking what's your favorite meal sanjay if you ever want to uh, buy me a meal you can buy me any meal i will probably enjoy it okay but um, okay so um, i want to mention a book that really made um like just made a huge impact on me last year and that is krupa's book so krupa's book um rivers remember is a book that i i mean i had said this in a in a re- review essay last year and at that point krupa and i didn't know each other i just read it and uh, i felt like everybody who lives in india especially people who live in cities in india should read it uh it's a work of non fiction it's beautifully written it's beautifully researched it's about the chennai floods but it's not about the chennai floods in that sense it's about what leads uh to such a disaster it is also like a portrait of the city the beautiful passages which are super super affectionate about particular people or 
his points of history it's a lovely book okay everybody should read it and sanjay i would highly recommend that you get it thank you oh my god i can't believe i did this <laughs> uh meetly <laughs> Sanjay, our friend. <laughs> Annie from Twitter has two questions. One is, um, in uh, Trinity, Nayantara expresses hatred for the way her friends change to fit into the traditional fold, and the comedian whose uh, personal preference for his more talented actor wife took precedence over his career. Did you mean uh, for the reading to be regressive in that women, no matter how successful or assertive, always fall back into the same systemic? patriarchal fold of tradition or did you intend to add nuance to the traditional subdued female figure by voicing her thoughts so i i think this is a good example of uh, you know whether my politics matches the politics of the uh, the story um uh, i think mostly when i was writing the story i was just thinking about this feeling of being ditched by your friends now right. i don't know about you but it has happened to me in first standard also and it has happened to me in 12th standard also it has happened right. to me in college also i mean it, it, it's not like your friend less but there is a particular gang with whom you have a certain life and you know that something and then it goes away so in class uh, one uh, my uh, my neighborhood plus first standard bestie chandrika suddenly stopped talking to me and she was sitting in the front and she turned to me and she and the other girl who she had become besties with like overnight okay the we were friends on friday on monday morning we were not friends I, i mean it remains a mystery in my life what went wrong chandrika why did you ditch me okay and i remember her face her turning to me and saying i don't want to talk to you anymore and just this this feeling of just kill me kill me now kill me before lunch break you know so uh, So th- that feeling more than anything else is what i wanted to capture in that uh, story right then her other question is about terrace i'm not going to read the whole one but i'm just going to give you um, the main part of the story which is what inspired you to you know sort of shift the gaze of the other woman from being like a indifferent or jealous female figure to like somebody who's so gentle and like empathetic um, you know the sort of So we, we are the narrator being the other woman i'm guessing right yeah that's what i or i think maybe like the person oh, teresa is the other woman okay 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 so um the story is a sort of thinly veiled homage of the daphne du maurier novel rebecca which has a format already of a young woman with very little uh, social um, confidence and uh, standing marrying a, a sort of socially um sort of a uh, uh, high standing man uh, who has a well known and dramatic uh, first marriage so that form is what i've worked with here uh, except as she gets to know in in the original as she gets to know through gossip and mystery and suspense here she gets to know the first wife who's passed away through all her online stuff which is in her laptop so um i feel like if one spent a lot of time with someone uh, even someone you're very jealous of or insecure of about it is inevitable that you would start feeling am empathetic in some way it's you know there's those, uh, those psychologists have these rules about propinquity which is which is approximately proximity is apparently the number one factor for falling in love so if they meet someone and then slowly they start becoming crazily attractive to you <laughs> is a sort of one kind of theory about falling in love right um Anna is asking when you're writing stories sort of anecdotes that other people have told you do you inform the other person that you've turned their narrative into a story should the writer tell the pro- person that they've borrowed that story like she's asking an ethical question i think are you ethically like should you tell them should you pass the story by them sorry can you uh, you know i i heard the, the ethical bit i didn't hear the bit before it's my internet connection just went So should you tell the person based on whom you're writing a story that you borrowed their story I mean ethically are you bound to sort of tell them it, it, it depends I mean if you know if it's about uh, people I'm close to I'm friends with like I actually know them I have actually shown people their stories afterwards not right like when I'm writing it I'm not calling them and fact checking <laughs> because it isn't in that sense 
a, a stable entity right. sometimes it's what i imagine what could have happened in some other situations it's not uh, it's not it's not journalism you know so it's not what actually happened at all um so sometimes i have shown it to people and uh, sometimes no i mean sometimes it's just things you hear in the air and then you know you want to do something with it so no i i don't feel ethically bound i mean i show it to friends because i feel like you know we'll we'll get a laugh out of it Right. right about it right. right swaroop asks uh, do you think the internet has changed how we experience our cities and in your case specifically how someone in their 20s would now experience bangalore interesting yeah i i do i do think that's true actually um because i feel like um to an extent the internet was a place to go to in in um, my 20s because uh, i had fairly limited mobility uh, you know in that sort of traditional way for a few years right in the beginning and once i started working and then you know control a la type situation happened so then it was okay but for a while there was internet as a place to go to to experience the world um but this idea that you're suggesting of experiencing your city through the internet i think is really interesting like um if you are on instagram i i i know how that experience immediately changes everything you're walking you're looking i mean it brings it brings a sort of you know um uh, what is the term that i'm looking for little square <laughs> you finder right it brings a sort of imaginary you finder to you all the time and you're you're dealing with, with little tile shaped pieces of the universe all the time right and uh, people right. map cities and uh, people put up threads of their fa- favorite places to eat there's this um, um nadika who is uh, uh, from uh, chennai and uh, who who's a writer and who's on uh, twitter I, i i wait for her threads on food because i feel like it'll take me roughly four lifetimes to try out the things that she recommends in chennai but i can imagine it okay because in <laughs> some sense chennai is a city that i wish i knew better so then through her threads on food in chennai i feel like okay now i can enjoy myself <laughs> right um i think that's the end of the questions from the internet and maybe i was thinking we could have like one more reading right i mean we can close with a reading and uh, sure. if uh, i'm allowed to or if i'm allowed to i'll ask you um, what you're working on now and what you're planning to work on <laughs> uh, and uh, oh wait i forgot my uh, most important question okay now well now that these questions are all uh, i'll ask you so it's very rare for an indian writer to have like a debut with a uh, short story collection what is your secret this is closely connected to your other question yes which is <laughs> so, <coughs> our publishers you and i uh show westland showed a lot of faith in me and commissioned me to write a non fiction book i then did not write it um i did not write it i went and had one baby <laughs> this is my excuse but the reason is not the baby i just did not write it i was doing many other things and being waste <laughs> then uh, i started settling down and started writing and researching the book again then right. i was once more pregnant okay right. at which point it had become ridiculous so uh, so uh, the only person who gave me a solution to my uh, shame and guilt and every other uh, horrible feeling i was ha- having was one random dude i met who told me very nice random dude who told me ki you, have you watched this sofia loren short film i was like this is not an answer to my problem why are you telling me this so no 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 it is the answer to the problem so apparently in this sofia loren <laughs> you should put on a t-shirt Yes, have you seen it? That that okay. So the Sophia Loren problem is that she is accused of some crime, but uh, according to the Italian system, she cannot go to jail because she is pregnant. Okay. So then, in this short film, she proceeds to have I don't know seven children or something because uh, this this is the best way to not go to jail in Italy. In that movie, let me add, in our system, just breathing is enough to go to jail. But uh, yes. so in pregnancy. just not an excuse to stay out of jail uh so uh, as we all know 
so anyway so in this moment of extreme shame and guilt um my my uh, my deal with westland was to do multiple books this short story book was to follow um but in a something is better than nothing sort of way i i looked very sad and they felt sorry for me and they said okay let's do this okay so this is where we are this is the truth <laughs> right so so uh, then i won't ask you about the next book um, <laughs> you know about it. it that it is a black hole of shame guilt and imposter syndrome that, that is what it is and i cannot have any more children to cover up these emotions oh <laughs> because i am not so fearless <laughs> right okay so wow okay let's get to the reading the final reading then uh, do you have anything else that uh, Uh, you'd like uh, to... yeah um if if you're okay with it i would like to read uh, a couple of sections from the triangle is that okay yes please okay because this is like sort of romantic <laughs> uh the triangle this was her only romantic fantasy one in which the man she's in love with becomes incandescent with jealousy because a man who was in love with her this was her only fantasy so she frugally squeezed infinite versions out of it so many versions it should have been the same old dal but it remained sweet and creamy one she's staring at the checkerboard floor of the bar smiling gently and her lover is smiling at her this is a beautiful smile with a clear varnish of smugness a smile in full possession of the knowledge that she is in his thrall he is a beautiful man so it is easy to ignore the radiance of his sureness or it should be easy but she's finding it hard everything is hard with this one she keeps her bra on when she's on top as if that will shield her from her unsureness as if it will steady her rhythm with him then she sleeps with her clothes off because under the sheets in the dark she's as smooth and unblemished as she would wish to be with him unable to be less in love with him she has decided it is easier if she's also in love with someone else someone else it could be someone brand new but really where's the fun in someone brand new what would be better than the man with whom she has most deployed it's complicated let him descend the staircase from the afternoon stillness of the first floor of the bar onto the checkerboard let him almost leap before he sees her he is not so beautiful he is as beautiful as she is just beautiful enough to feel like they have as the song goes game by the pound he almost leaps and then sees her from the corner of his eye holding hands with a good looking stranger he pivots and greets her warmly introductions abound the two men chat this is the part of the fantasy she dislikes the most but she hasn't found a way of making the transition to the next stage with any other filler surely the waiter cannot drop a tray before introductions are made if the tray is dropped too far from them they wouldn't care if the tray is dropped too close to them her lover is either likely to say something to the waiter and damn himself or requite himself with his grasp on their class dynamic either way this would tilt the balance dramatically she doesn't want to pick one or the other lover she wants them to pick her perfect that's actually one of my favorite lines in the book is in this story which is unable to be less in love with him she has decided it is easier if she's also in love with someone else i think it sort of really captures something about the the flavor of this book so um Uh, i think i have come to the end of my questionnaire also uh with this uh, let me just give me one minute because i don't want to miss a question uh, i just want to go through my notes here to sort of make sure that i didn't leave anything out in the chat i am seeing many rude comments like my friend dipika bhardwaj is saying some people are actually very large monuments dipika <laughs> <laughs> I think I just noticed that. Oh, What is it? Uh, Divya Ramesh said the M M O R P G O oh, para in triangle made me giggle. Yes, yes, yes. I love Krupa's book too. Yes, Deepika has read your book, even though she's very rude. She loves your book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I do have a question that I have forgotten to ask you, which is. Um, Do you ever wonder about what happens to all these people in your books after the story ends? I mean, I'm dying to know in like at least a few stories what happened next. I mean, do you ever feel like you would return to them? Please, please tell me. I will call you and I will tell you what happens to them next. Okay. Private chat. <laughs> Pooja Pandey is asking, 
is this the one where someone wanted to make a film on you only you would be a man ah ha okay uh yeah okay this is some crazy story okay so uh, this is in my youth there was something called the pink chadi movement never mind we will skip ahead the to the moment that pooja yes. party is describing where i was at work and i got a call from a guy who said he is in hyderabad in some place he's part of some film thing and could they make a movie about the pink chadi movement so i was like you know free world you know do your thing bye bye went back to work then i got an email confirming and then he said he signed up a big star and whatever so again i was not thinking too much then i got a call from him to confirm confirm that i'm okay with all of this and so when i started tuning into the conversation is when i realized that um yes they were going to make a movie based on the pink chadi movement in some sense but the leader of the movement and or the only leader by the one person who's leading the movement would be a dude okay so i said but why <laughs> you know it was all women why do you want to have a dude so he said it won't be realistic madam if you have a lady leading the movement <laughs> okay so uh so i said very good now you do your thing eventually i i mean years later i figured it was this uh, vivek uh, agnihotri movie called buddha in a traffic jam <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Sorry, that explains that well, explains everything. Didn't it have like the beginnings of like this whole urban axel theory <laughs> like Buddha yes, yes, yes. right? Yes. yes. It's all my fault. Let's go on. <laughs> this is um wow. You learned something new in this panel today. Uh <laughs> <laughs> all right i think uh, wait let me get the i think we think chaddi was awesome someone says so uh, thanks we all thank you all 3000 of us <laughs> it really was it really was awesome i i remember those days i think that's okay, it yeah. i think we've come to the end of all the questions this good yeah now we can all go home yeah <laughs> so, yes. cool I'm so happy to have had this conversation. I'm feeling so like chill. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I just people. Yeah. Thank you both so much. This uh, you know it really just felt like we were sitting around having a cup of coffee and chatting and just listening to you guys. So thank you so much for being part of Public Text and thank you to everybody who attended. Uh, just take a look at the chat. You have our sign up sheet. You have the link to the YouTube uh, channel. So yeah, please follow us on. all our social media handles and we hope to see everybody at the next public text session in october thank you again take care